Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, we introduce our Economics Roundtable segment with a discussion of the looming fiscal cliff and other issues facing Congress and the White House. Our guests are Don Lee, an economics reporter for the Los Angeles Times, Don Wolfensberger, a Wilson Center senior scholar and a resident scholar with the Bipartisan Policy Center, and Kent Hughes, director of the Wilson Center's program on America and the global economy. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us. Uh, you know, coming out of the election, I'm wondering what would be the proper word to characterize the circumstances as we uh, seek to address this fiscal cliff question. Uh, the Obama administration would like to use the term mandate. Uh, others are not so sure about that. Is there momentum? How would you characterize it? Don, let's begin with you. Well, I think precarious might be one mm. word uh, to describe the state of the economy. Um, certainly, um, concerns about the, the fiscal cliff have already uh, weighed on business uh, investments. And uh, businesses, for the most part, you know, have been driving the ec uh, economic recovery. And, um, but in recent months, investments have uh, tailed off. and. It hasn't really hit consumers yet, but if that, if the fiscal cliff uh, will get closer and nothing happens, then I think consumers are going to start biting their nails, and if they pull back, then we're going to have some trouble. Mm -hmm. Don Wolfensberger, the other Don, we have two Dons today. Uh, two Dons and a Godfather, perhaps? Oh. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the momentum, I guess, is uh, what you call it, perhaps, if you're on the Republican side of the ledger. But, uh, mandate is what you call it on the Democratic side, but characterize the, the environment on the hill for these negotiations. Well, I'm wary of using the, the term mandate because both Obama and John Boehner have claimed mandates even though of the, of the opposite party. But I think the mood on the hill is that uh, both parties see the need to move forward given the precarious uh, cliff that is confronting them. And I think uh, what came out of the electorate was sort of a mixed message, but I think that probably works to the advantage of both the, the president and the Republicans in the Congress that they have room to negotiate. When, uh, on the mixed message, uh, how do you interpret it? Well, I think that uh, the obviously the, the exit polls show that people support Obama and wanting to tax the rich. At the same time, those same exit polls show that a majority of the people still think that we should have smaller government, but they love their services. So uh, it's, it's a very mixed message as to how you go about you know, cutting spending at the same time maintaining the level of services that people expect. Uh, a, a consistently inconsistent message for the electorate. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, Kent, the, again, I'll get you on the characterization question, then I want to ask you something further about this fiscal cliff uh, uh, terminology. But first, how do you see the situation? Well, I, I think both of the Dons are right. There's an apprehension in the business world that hasn't quite hit the consumer yet, that the retailers are expecting about a 4% growth uh, in retail spending this year, and that's not bad given the fact that you still have a large level of unemployment. And wages per se have not been going up. It's really the fact that there are more people working and they're consuming and that makes things a little brighter. But I think the, the question of a, of a mandate is probably overdone in a broad sense. And it really is because as soon as you leave an abstraction, like let's get rid of the loopholes, and you start saying which loophole, suddenly that becomes more problematic where you want to cut spending and then you say, well, why are we cutting this or cutting that? So that tension between that long-standing desire to have a small government with big services is still being played out in today's debate. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a mandate to get something done, but not more specific than that. Well, I think there's a concern here and really around the world about whether American politics can really function the way it needs to. And this is a terrific opportunity for us to say yes and would certainly be problematic if we end up saying no. The notion of a fiscal cliff, uh, I think, was that Ben Bernanke who first? It was Ben term? Bernanke, yeah. The, is that an accurate term? That, that's very ominous. It, you know, driving over a cliff is a dangerous and deadly thing to do. Is, it, is that an accurate description? Well, I, don't, I don't think he used that phrase by accident. I think he wanted to concentrate minds if he could. If you think of actually nothing being done, that your taxes would go up next year, everybody's taxes would go up next year, but you would feel that gradually, month by month, as you saw something more withheld from your paycheck. The same is true with the reducing spending. Even if there's no way to sort of fudge that, some people speculate that there are ways to do that, 
the spending cuts would play out over the years. So it would be more of a gradual slide. A fiscal slope you're describing more right. than a cliff. What I think, going back to Don's initial comment, I think the business community and perhaps even more of the financial markets would be concerned about that. And you would see more of a financial markets can react overnight even though nothing real or nothing totally real has happened yet. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the cliff. Is it, Don, there's been some talk from Democrats that they're willing to go over the cliff if it's what they have to do to uh, hold the line on eliminating the Bush tax cuts at 250000 and up. Is, is that gamesmanship, or, or, or are there people in either party who are willing to take the debt? I think there are people in both parties that are of the what, what I've heard called the letter rips school. Let's go over the cliff. That will focus minds even more, uh, notwithstanding the, the prospects of another recession and, and loss of maybe two million jobs. Uh, so, yeah, there are some of that uh, school of thought, but I don't think it's predominant, uh, and I think it's fortunate that it's not predominant. Let's, let's see what happens. I think the conservative Republicans or some think that this will finally bring people to the table for real spending cuts to get serious about, about the issues that are out there. And, and uh, a lot of the liberals say this is the only way we're going to cut defense spending, for instance. And uh, so, you know, you've got, you've got those extremes, but I don't think the, they are a majority of either party. Don Lee, reading, reading the tea leaves on this question of taxation, there's been a lot of talk in the last week about Grover Norquist and people moving away from the pledge or at least saying that it's not as binding as it once was. Is the environment right now for some changes in taxation? Well, um, Upward, obviously, because that's what we're talking about, generating more revenue. I think there is a, a realization, and certainly on the political front, uh, with uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 more hardcore uh, uh, you might say uh, Tea Party uh, representatives uh, having lost, and uh, and the realization that uh, uh, that there has to be something that has to give here. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, there is a sense that uh, that you know this is the time to do it, and I think uh, you know both politically and economically, you know you have both, you know you have besides the fiscal cliff, you also have the debt ceiling, and you also really need, as many have talked about. Uh, um, establishing a credible uh, um, budget for the medium term and long term. And I think that those three things are all tied together. And I think uh, uh, so, t and taxation is clearly a part of that. So we're going to have to wrestle that down. Right. What the Tea Party, what I, I heard of them a while ago. It, it is stunning how a couple, uh, one election cycle ago, they were the toast of the town. Everything was about the Tea Party and virtually unspoken during this last round of elections. Is the Tea Party still a vibrant and important force within the House of Representatives in particular? I think the Tea Party is still there and these are not just people that were elected in the last round. There are some people that were elected this time around that uh, certainly hold the same views on, on fiscal austerity or fiscal responsibility as they call it, but uh, I think there's a new realism setting in overall with the Republican Party that, uh, as Don has said, uh, something's got to give. And so I think you're going to see a bit more flexibility, but on any budget deal that's cut, you're going to have a, a substantial m a number of Republicans that won't go along with it if it involves any type of increase in revenues, which I think most people think has to happen. Are there areas of agreement? Are there places where there is common ground currently among the two parties where you can use that as a foundation to build? Well, I think the, the revenue question has really been opened a good deal more. Speaker Boehner has talked about increases in revenue, not increases in tax rates. That drives you well, back. What, then to, what does that mean? Well, that means, in effect, going after a series of loopholes or tax expenditures or tax preferences, really depending on whether you're a beneficiary or not. But if you look at the items, the really expensive items, very difficult to change them. Let's say modifying or eliminating the deductibility of home mortgages. You have, even before this was an actual proposal, just when Governor Romney mentioned it as a possibility, the entire housing industry was organized. What about eliminating charitable deductions? Immediately the universities were organized because they depend heavily on those mm -hmm. alumni gifts. So doing something on the loopholes may well happen in a modest way, but it's not going to be easy. That drives you back then to thinking about, well, what about tax rates, which has been so difficult for the, not just the Tea Party, but really the Republican Party as a whole to deal with. One, going back to Grover Norquist for just a minute, one of the attractions that some people see in going over the cliff for just a minute with regard to the taxes, 
If you did it on January 1st, then January 2nd, you could make a lot of changes in taxes that would be tax cuts. So that would not violate the pledge. Now, you, you mentioned this notion of closing loopholes. When, when uh, Governor Romney and uh, Paul Ryan spoke about that during the campaign, there was criticism that the math doesn't work, that there aren't enough loopholes to be closed to be able to move the needle adequately enough. Is that what you're describing, that you're still talking I think, about? Uh, the top 10 mm -hmm. uh, loopholes add up uh, on an annual basis, something like $864 billion, so that's not an inconsequential sum. But again, making that kind of dent in the loopholes is just strikes almost everyone as, as undoable. So w where are we headed here? Is there the whole notion of common ground? Do you see any place where there's a strong agreement as a starting point? I think there, there is, and I, I do think that there's going to still be some give on what the president asked for, and that is a, a tax increase for the, the top earners. Uh, even Bill Crystal, the conservative editor of the Weekly Standard, says it's not going to kill the country if, uh, the, if millionaires have to pay a bit more in taxes. He says, after all, half of them are in Hollywood and they're Democrats. So in any event, he, he's not pained by, by that prospect. But, so I think there's some wiggle room there. Certainly they're going to be exploring all the, the various tax loopholes that can be closed. Um, you know, I think you're going to get, at the end of the day, a balanced picture that's going to take us into next year to finally flesh out the details, but there's going to be a down payment made, I think, during this lame duck session of some, during the some sort. Now, can there be a grand bargain in the lame duck session? I mean, you know, you, nobody knows this institution in this town better than you. Is that possible in a lame duck session, or is that too ambitious? I guess anything's possible. I don't see it happening because they're only going to be in another three or four weeks, and you're talking about a lot of details that are going to have to be worked out, even if they have a, a general idea of where the grand bargain is going to end up. It's, it's not going to uh, be possible, I think, to flesh out until sometime later next year. Mm -hmm. uh, Don, this whole notion of the grand bargain that came up during the negotiations between the president and Speaker Boehner, which fell through at the last minute, is that back on the table now in a significant way? Is that what we're looking at? Something that's even larger than, that may include things like significant tax reform that may change the, the fiscal picture in a dramatic way moving forward? I think longer range that is, uh, and again, uh, because the debt ceiling and uh, a medium-term tax plan uh, and budget, uh, uh, and how to reduce uh, deficits over several years, not just uh, you know uh, in the next year or two, um, and how to deal with uh, rising health care costs. These are all things that are tied together with the fiscal cliff. And the notion of a grand bargain would be to somehow use the current situation to address both the short-term and medium-term uh, issues that we face. And I don't think it's possible to do something like that uh, with any specificity in a short period of time. But you can lay a, a framework and then agree that you know, over the next few months, they're going to work out the details of that that will address all those things. And that would be what a grand bargain could be. How, how much time is there for that type of uh, sort of uh, uh, or layered approach where get some things done now in the lame duck session to avoid the fiscal cliff? extend some deadlines, whatever the case may be, however you want to characterize it, and then look ahead to building this grander bargain later, y you could see easily how we could start then talking about the midterm elections, and let's postpone it again and kick the can further down the road. I think you've got an opportunity, though, to uh, set a framework. And the question is, how firm a framework is it going to be? You could, at one possibility is you could actually direct each individual committee to report back, let's say in six months, with a certain level of savings as a way of avoiding that sequester, that kind of random cutting across the board. On the loopholes or tax reform, remember that in 1986, the last time there was major tax reform, that was the product of two years of work. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a a harder question to be sure you would do that in the next two years because we're just really starting that serious discussion now. Is, uh, veterans of, of Capitol Hill, uh, both of these gentlemen, Don, worked on the Hill in another life. Can you, what is the sense that this could be a moment where something historic could happen? Is the leadership in place? Can this president, this speaker, this majority leader, are these people who you think can bring it together in a way where we, we really do, as you open, uh, began in your opening answer by uh, dis discussing, Kent, 
send the world a message that America can still make big decisions and can still get some things done? Well, I've kept my eye on Senator Durbin, who is the number two leader of the Democratic Party in the Senate. And he has been talking openly about, well, yes, he can see some adjustments in the entitlements, which has been the, the tougher step for the Democrats to take. And I can't imagine that he's doing that without having talked to Harry Reid first. Uh, and Secre Speaker Boehner has uh, really a background as being a very effective legislator. Uh, when he was chair of the Education Committee, uh, he, was, uh, he was a very active legislator. And I think he knows that, in a way, the future of the Republican Party is also tied to showing that they can be effective at governing. Any other thoughts on that? I, I, I guess I come back to the, the, the movie I saw this uh, past week, uh, Lincoln, which uh, he mm. got the 13th Amendment through abolishing slavery during a lame duck session. And there are, there's a lot of possibilities for laying the, the type of framework that Kent is talking about during this period because you have a lot of people that aren't coming back are maybe going to have a little more of a profile and courage since they're not going to be up for re-election the next time around. And so you're going to have to have people from both parties, but you're going to have to, as you point out, have to have leadership in the Congress and from the President and, and working together to, to get this done. It's not just going to happen. I'd like to hear more about Lincoln as well, but we have to keep our focus <laughs> on the economy. A, uh, two thumbs up. What's your review, Don? Good film? Excellent film. It's yeah. Academy Award material. Yeah, oh, terrific, terrific. Uh, the, uh, let's look beyond the U.S. borders. It's not just, I guess, the U.S. who's on mm. trial here as far as getting things done in the economy. Well, there are other things that could happen that could have a, a negative impact on the global economy and interdependence. We got the situation in the Eurozone and the, the continuing, the next deadline for Greece. We have a slowing Chinese economy. Uh, give us your thoughts on, and we'll start with you, Don, on what are the other things that could happen around the globe that might factor into this equation? Sure. Uh, well, um, you mentioned the Eurozone, um, and uh, the Eurozone economies are in recession, and, um, uh, and France and Germany, even those two stalwart uh, nations, are slipping very close to uh, recession levels, uh, and so uh, that is a concern. At the same time, I think some of the worries have eased a bit because uh, the European Central Bank has uh, taken some steps that, uh, that suggest that they are very keen in keeping, uh, doing whatever is necessary, as uh, you know, the ECB uh, you know, chairman has said, uh, to, to keep the euro uh, intact and, uh, and to be the banker of uh, lender of last resort. So I think there are some hopeful signs, uh, and it will take a long time, though, to work out the details of having a uh, you know, banking union and creating other uh, institutions uh, so that it could operate in a way that, they w that this long divide culturally and economically uh, could somehow be bridged. And so that will take some time. And uh, China, uh, you're right, it has slowed uh, quite a bit. Uh, they don't like growth to be below 8%. It's sort of a, a government slogan to keep it at 8% or above, uh, and it slipped below that. But I think there's some signs that it's bottomed, and, uh, and so, uh, and the Chinese government does have uh, 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 considerable reserves and wherewithal to um, stimulate the economy, unlike uh, our, uh, our government. And so, and I think some of that is beginning to kick in, and uh, you're seeing some signs that things are stabilizing. And, you know, Brazil is beginning to uh, show some growth, uh, stronger growth, and, uh, and the developing economies are, I think uh, there are some encouraging signs there. So I think on, the, on a more global uh, perspective, things uh, uh, are, uh, you know, are much better than they were earlier this year. And uh, if the U.S. could get its fiscal cliff uh, uh, straightened out, then uh, I think you could have uh, you know, things in place uh, for some stronger growth. That's a very positive report. I thank you for that relief. I give me some optimism. <laughs> you know, Kent, last time you, you and I talked about this on the air, um, it was uh, in the context of this question of uh, stimulus versus austerity measures mm -hmm. in Europe. You, you mentioned stimulus. Where are we in that equation? What's happening in this great global experiment of how to navigate out of this crisis? Well, I would say that right now Europe has experimented with austerity. Great Britain is a prime example, too, even though it's not in the Eurozone. And it has not proved to be a palliative. So my bias would be not to opt for a great deal of austerity now. I really think Don's right talking about middle term in terms of 
rising taxes and looking to balance the budget, hopefully in the context of growth. I think that uh, the other questions we should be asking before we just put the green eye shade on is, do we want to grow in the future? And that means we have to look at investments in science, education, infrastructure, and we want to decide what degree of leadership do we want to provide in the world. And in a sense, that's a bundle of State Department, DOD, cybersecurity, and so forth. But again, we've got to decide how much we want to pay for that. And the final question we should be say, asking is, what kind of a community do we want to be? And at least for myself, it's still uncomfortable to be the richest country in the world and have tens of millions of people that are uh, in one case in poverty and the other case without health insurance. So I think we want to wrestle with those questions and in part that last question is going to drive us back to take another hard look at the health care system in the United States. We spend more than twice the OECD average in terms of our overall economy and since our economy is bigger that's more than twice as much per person yet we don't always get better results. So I think now that Obamacare is the law of the land, the question no longer is waivers to repeal it and so forth, but to make it better and to really again look at this question of health care costs. Well, thanks for uh, guiding us to a big question to end on. Gentlemen, thank you very much and enjoy the holiday. Appreciate you joining us and maybe we can have you back when this thing develops further and, and see where we stand at that point. It would be a thank pleasure, you, John. John. Thank you. Uh, when we return, we resume our look at the Arab Spring, this time from the perspective of a former Prime Minister of Lebanon. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. As the Middle East continues to change and evolve, we continue our look at the region, this time with the help of a former Prime Minister. Fuad Senora provides context on the Arab Spring from the perspective of Lebanon. Let's take a look. How has the Arab Spring affected Lebanon? Well, definitely we look very positively about the progress of democracy in the Arab world. And the Arab Spring with, uh, with all what's happening in, 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 in these countries, I think this is for the, for the, for the, for the benefit of Lebanon. The more uh, progr progress takes place in terms of more democracy in the Arab world, this is for the benefit of Lebanon. And that's how we really reacted to what's happening. Definitely, we know that we don't want to really interfere in the domestic affairs of any, any Arab country. But this does not really preclude us from expressing our, op our opinion uh, clearly. Intervening in, in, in this matter, we, 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 we don't agree to it. But expressing our opinion clearly that we are committed to democracy and the more democracy prevails in the Arab world, then it is for the benefit of Lebanon. What is the impact of the ongoing conflict in Syria? We are concerned about the, uh, the level of killing that's taking place in Syria, the atrocities that are being committed by the, by the regime, and uh, the continuation with no deterrent to this. Although I actually that the, the Syrians, when they demonstrated uh, at the, for, the, for the first six or seven months, they never asked for a regime change. And they were all, all, all always chanting that we wanted to be peaceful and to really preserve national unity. So this is what they have been asking. What we are really now expressing our views is that we support this uprising and we support the, uh, the establishment of a civil state in Syria where everybody has the similar, similar rights and, and similar obligations and no, with no difference to sect, to religion, to uh, affiliation or anything of the sort. This is what we are really clear about what's happening in Syria. Beyond the headlines, when you look instead at trend lines, where is the region headed?
Well, I effectively look with, uh, with optimism at what's happening. After years of stagnation in the Arab world, in which people were talking about uh, the Arab exception uh, uh, compared to what has been going on in, the, in, the, uh, in, in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, elsewhere. I think now we are seeing that the, uh, this uh, wave of democracy is coming along and assisted by the need to have change and this assisted by the same time by the te technological revolution that we are really witnessing that it, what is happening is now ha happening under the global eye. So nobody can really stop the progress towards democracy in the Arab world and this is something that's come to happen and this is for the benefit of the population of these countries. As the region continues to change and evolve, what are your expectations for the role of the international community? I mean, what's expected from the international community is always to stay faithful to the principles that they really talk about. Principles of democracy, of openness, of tolerance, of respect of human lives. These are the uh, uh, f freedom, this, these are the values that we want to uh, really raise and we, we need the support of the international community to stay faithful and to support the forces of moderation in the Arab world and definitely to uh, help in furthering cooperation that will ultimately lead to better levels of prosperity and more job creation and better standards of living. New editions of Context can be found each week at wilsoncenter.org slash context. That's all for this week's edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molesky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhcnetworks.org.